I, I want to thank uh, Roger Alford, Professor Alford, for his really moving and wonderful introduction. Uh, it really provides a base to, to begin this conversation. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit of the same ground, but only as part of my introduction, and try and talk about uh, and take us all the way through to something that happened very recently, uh, which I didn't expect to be doing, but uh, I will do that. So I've been asked to talk about the Office of the Public Protector and other Chapter 9 institutions. Chapter 9 is a, a chapter of the 1996, the final constitution. And what I want to talk about really is have we seen, or are we beginning to see in the South African story something that I'm actually doing a, a broader study at the moment globally of the emergence of what I'm going to call integrity and integrity branch, a potential fourth branch of government. Uh, and so I will end the conversation with a discussion about separation of powers because that's what this issue is going to come down to. Uh, but if we think about, when I just introduced this idea of the integrity branch, the Chapter 9, in fact, has uh, a number of different institutions within it. And among those institutions, I'm going to privilege three as this integrity branch. The other three have a more forward-looking uh, role, uh, a role that is... In, in the case of the one, the South African Human Rights Commission, which we'll hear more about later, uh, it's, it's got a little bit of the integrity branch built into it, but it doesn't stand out in quite the same way as the three institutions that I will talk about, which is the Public Protector, the Independent Electoral Commission, and the Auditor General, which really do form a separate integrity branch, so I will argue. Uh, the Human Rights Commission, the Commission for Gender Equality, the Commission for the Promotion and Protection of Cultural religious and linguistic uh, uh, um, communities is, are all forward-looking. Their role is to both help establish the rights that they protect, but also to advocate for them and to develop them in the country. They're not just to protect against violation, and that's why I draw that distinction. So what about this question of accountability? Uh, when we think about accountability in a constitutional system, Traditionally, we think about the three branches and we locate accountability, at least in the South African tradition historically, with Parliament. The legislature is supposed to hold the executive accountable. Now, the sad history of South Africa, which we've heard a bit about, never included serious accountability for a number of reasons, uh, partly the nature of that old colonial and then apartheid regime, but also because, if you think about it, infused systems where members of the executive are actually sit in the legislature, and in fact the political parties that control the legislature are controlled by the leadership which are running the executive, uh, the possibility of serious accountability is always at issue. And, you know, the British, through a system of convention, and historically at least, uh, the system of the slightest whiff of anything, somebody would resign quietly, uh, that was the tradition of accountability that the British maintained. Uh, but even in Britain today, you've got to go a lot further before they're prepared to step aside. So that problem of accountability is very real in parliamentary systems. The United States, of course, has a system of accountability that is much more rooted in the complete separation of institutions. And so you've got a kind of functional, uh, 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 a formal process of separation of powers where Congress is controlled by a completely different group and divided often between the Senate and the House of Representatives and where you have the executive way out and, of course, the role of the judiciary. And I'll talk a little bit more of that just generally later. Uh, but that's one particular vision of the separation of powers, and it's not like it's always worked perfectly here either. Right? So that is a, a difficult issue. Accountability in South Africa and the new regime. So the old regime, you had very little accountability. And one of the interesting things is to think about, because accountability often raises this issue of corruption. One of the really interesting things about that, of course, is the old regime in South Africa 
basically ran a system where corruption was never regulated. It was part of the system, right? There was no, the, the, the very basic laws that are applied to South Africa, in South Africa today that deal with corruption are all post-1994 laws. It's not that there was a legal system in place to deal with corruption. The fact that the National Party took a cut of all procurement and that procurement in the old apartheid regime went to friends and members of the party was quite normal. It wasn't an issue. Right? It wasn't even an issue in the media. This was just how the world ran. And what was really, one of the really interesting examples is the fact that uh, the parliament is in the Western Cape, which is the wine country. And in fact, members of parliament in the old regime used to receive wine from the wine farmers all the time as part of their place. And in fact, you know, it's kind of the dop system for the politicians, if anyone <laughs> remembers what that was. Uh, but what's, what's really fascinating about that is post-94, that continued. <laughs> right? they, they continued to receive those free boxes of wine until eventually they started passing laws and started to institute systems in South Africa to try and deal with that kind of influence. The biggest failure, and I'll be upfront about that, is in the, new, in the transition, we never dealt with the question of party funding. That has not been adequately dealt with. And that's the core of what becomes the, what one journalist has called the poisoned chalice of South African democracy, which was the arms core deal. And the arms core deal, which, which was done in the old format, we do a deal with you and as a result you cut a certain amount for the party and then we started falling out over some people taking some of it for individuals in the process. Uh, which all the way through in Kantla starts with the arms deal. Right? So that is the poison chalice of our democracy. But there was nothing at the time in law that made it illegal. Ethically it was a problem, but it wasn't actually illegal. Right? It was the new regime that started creating the laws that it then tripped over, which is fascinating at another level. So. Accountability in the old regime was located in a particular committee in Parliament. The Parliamentary Committee, the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, or SCOPA. And what's interesting about SCOPA is the first ANC Parliament gave the head of that committee, right, they were the majority party and you heard the numbers, 60% to 62% uh, to the rest, they could have taken every committee just like we would do in Congress here. But they gave the head of the accountability committee, Scopa, to the opposition. And that lasted until the arms deal arrived in that committee and it all fell apart and then they quickly got rid of that. But their first intention was to try and create parliamentary accountability. But as I said, in a few system particularly, that is very hard to do and we've proved in South Africa it's impossible to maintain proper parliamentary accountability of the executive. And that leaves the question, well, what about alternatives? And so I'll talk briefly now about the origins of the Chapter 9 institutions in South Africa. Because Chapter 9 is only in the 1996 constitution. The earliest proposals or ideas about the, uh, having institutions to check government, check the executive and, and other branches of government, was the proposal in 1990 in the African National Congress's Constitutional Committee for an ombudsperson. So there they, they, they embraced the notion of an ombuds. There was already an ombud that was put in by the old regime right towards the end, but it was a very, very ineffectual office. It didn't do very much. And the South African Law Commission around the same time also started discussing the idea of an ombuds. Right? So following that old Swedish model originally and but looking to having some institution that would be called the Ombuds. Uh, the real origins of this process, though, begins in that transition that Roger Alfred was talking about. It begins at, in the problem of how to manage that transition. And what wasn't pointed out, what, uh, what I, he spoke about, but I would give a little more emphasis to, was the amount of violence that actually took place between 1990 and 1994. Right? Between the mid-80s and 1994, 
South Africa lost approximately 20,000 people. Right? That was the height of the conflict. Most of them take place, most of those deaths take place in those four years. That we often forget. We talk about the wonderful, peaceful creation of the Rainbow Nation, and we forget how violent that last part, in fact, was. And in the context of that, the issue of an election, of holding an election, became central. How would that be done? And as you saw, until very late in the negotiations, the old regime was refusing to accept a date, because once that date was accepted, everything would flow. And so they resisted that. They wanted all, everything agreed to before that date could be announced. But the death of Krasani and the reaction to that forced the agreement to get a date. And once that date happened. But prior to that, the issue was, well, if we had a date and we're going to have an election, who would run that election? And from the beginning, the old government assumed, as it had for every election before then, the white elections that had taken place, and even when they had elections for other communities in the process change of the years, elections were run by the government. That was the normal way in which elections were run in South Africa. The government departments actually ran them. And there was no ways we could accept an election run by the apartheid government, because whatever the numbers that came out, we would question them. That was a problem, an inherent problem. And it was in that context that... The ANC had thought they'd solved this problem. Oliver Tambo had worked very hard in exile for the adoption of something called the Harari Declaration. This declaration was adopted by the Organization of African Unity's Liberation Committee in late 1988, uh, 89, and that declaration said that the way the transition should happen in South Africa should be the adoption of an interim government and after the interim government, then a negotiations for a constituent assembly. That was, and when the ANC was unbanned and returned to South Africa, that's what the ANC fought for. Wanted an interim government. But a debate, certain, and a lot of the demonstrations, the mobilization that was spoken about, was demanding this interim government. Because we didn't trust the existing regime to actually run an election to have a, a decent process. The problem with that, of course, and we soon started to realize that, what would it mean to have an interim government? Would we put Mandela in government to run an interim government with no control over all the institutions below him, who would then just continue to do whatever they wanted to do anyway? And that debate began in the ANC. Um, and it was quite intense. I was put up at one point against uh, Raymond Sutner, who was supposed to argue the other side at a meeting of the National Executive Committee. And I was arguing for independent institutions. So I'd been sent with the National Democratic Institute from the United States to Guatemala to observe an election. The NC sent me. And I went to see what do election observers do when they observe. Because we knew this was coming, but we knew nothing about it. And the one thing I saw was they had an independent electoral commission in Guatemala. And the Independent Electoral Commission in Guatemala ran the election, and even though there was no way that that election was free, if anybody mentioned land reform, they were assassinated in minutes. But it was fair. Every ballot was counted correctly, right? Free is another issue, but it was fair. We looked at them and said, hmm. So I came back with this argument about what about independent institutions? And we had this debate. But what way it came down to was the way to deal with the fact that we didn't want the government to run an election was to propose a set of independent institutions. And if some of you will recall, not only the Independent Electoral Commission, but there was an independent media commission, and there, was, there were three independent bodies created in the transition before 1994, before the election, and were created in order to manage that transition independent from the government of the day. Those were, that was the idea behind having these independent institutions. And it was from this experience and from the success of the IEC that there was a certain amount of faith going forward that there'd be a place for independent institutions. The Auditor General had existed for 100 years. There were some institutions to, to bring into this. In the 1993 interim, interim constitution, however, 
they weren't actually pulled together. They all there in bits and pieces. Right? In the 1996 constitution, they get pulled together into a single chapter. And that's where I start making the argument that we start to see the emergence of an integrity branch of government. We have this independent chapter, which we're not quite sure how to deal with. Right? It's a, we've got the legislature, we've got the executive, we've got the courts. They all have their own chapters. And yeah, there's this other chapter called Chapter 9. And what role is that supposed to play? And that has been what has played out in part through the public protector, the history and the story of the public protector. And so, because the Independent Electoral Commission has in fact continued quite successfully until now and managed a number of elections. There's been challenges. There are challenges right now about how it's functioning. But the fact is it has successfully held a series of elections. So, what about the question of the public protector. And so what I want to do is just show you a few. I've been doing a study on this for a little while now, and I'll show you a few of the... Uh, the my first round of this, in fact, just was published in the uh, New York Law Review as a result of the first 20th anniversary <laughs> session that we did last year. Um, oh, no, that doesn't work. How does this work? Ah, there we are. So the first thing to think about is when you create a new institution and... Jackie Cassette, who here, was part of that early institution, right? She served under the first public protector, uh, Selby Bakwa. What's interesting is that that first institution, you have to develop an institution. You can't just declare one. It's got to actually open offices. It's got to get people into the institution, etc. And if you see between 1995 and 2004, they slowly open offices, both a national office and offices around the country. The orange bars is the cumulative development of the institution. As you can see, by 2004, they're opening fewer offices because by then they've actually got offices around the country, right? They've actually set the institution up in part. Another way to look at an institution and how it develops, of course, is to follow the money. And it is quite impressive how the amount of money that has flown to the public protector over the years, right? So if you see that first budget in 1998, uh, it's, you know, it's not nothing. It's nearly 20 million rand, but it is not the 180 million rand that we see in 2013, right? which has gone even higher. Now it's kind of stabilized. They, they're trying to bleed it from a little bit of money because it's not behaving itself. But... What's interesting, too, about this rise, it wasn't just state money. One of the things this institution was able to do was call on supporters and NGO supporters, etc., internationally to help with some support. And that's a, obviously an issue for government as well, but that is one of the ways in which, particularly in the last few years, you see that dramatic rise in spending. Another way to look at it is in terms of the number of employees, right? So we got less than 100 employees by 1999. That was that initial period. But by 2012, 2013, we've got coming towards 300 employees, right? Again, this institution's building. One of the interesting things about the way this institution is built and these local offices is, is I would argue, a reflection of the problem you have with proportional representation. So our electoral system is based on proportional representation, and so it comes from party lists. And the thing, problem with the party list, and the ANC is tried, right? They, they, they assign members who are on the list, they assign them to constituencies. They say, those are your constituents. You need to go and build the relationship. I, I knew one who set up an office, actually used their private money to set up an office in this community and said, I'm here, I'm your representative. And nobody came. Because why? We don't know you. We didn't elect you. There's a problem with proportional representation. I don't think we had any choice in South Africa, given the racial geography of apartheid, to have anything but in the early elections. But the big question, one of the questions on the table, I think, going forward, is going to be, can we move to a mixed system where you've got a certain amount of proportionality, which the Constitution demands, but also where you can get some direct representation all the way up to Parliament, where people feel it's their own person. And I was enamored very early on with this idea of uh, the German model, which is a combined model of the two. 
But I have learned to my chagrin that, in fact, in the German model, one of the problems is, yes, you now have people in Parliament that you feel represent you. That's good. The trouble is, is within Parliament, those people aren't the people with power. People with power are the ones who come off the list because they know the party hierarchy. They're chosen by them. Right? So there's a, there's a tension even in that system. But I would suggest it's better than not having access. How does it relate to the public protector? Well, one of the interesting things that I think has happened over the last period is that people who have constituency-type complaints, the complaints in the normal parliamentary system where you go to your, your elect, elected representative and you have a problem with government for this and they intervene for you, doesn't happen in a proportional system. The public protector has started to fulfill that role. This is what the public protector calls uh, the Gogo Dlamini cases, the grandmother Dlamini cases. Uh, and Gogo Dlamini cases are very small cases. Uh, I go to the bureaucracy to get my certificate for this or that, and they are rude, they turn me away or whatever. And the public protector, the local officers have intervened just to make that happen, very effectively. And there's been no difficulty at that level. In fact, the public protector has explained to me that She'd rather prefer not to be having these high-profile cases, thank you very much, because the general stuff works very well. And until we ran into the difficulty of these high-profile cases, the lower government officials were very responsive. One of the problems of the conflicts that have developed now around this institution is that now the lower officials are kind of conflicted about whether they should cooperate or not. Because if number one is not cooperating, what does it mean if I cooperate? Am I not being loyal? Uh, there's issues here that I think are quite significant. But in other ways, this number of employees, number of cases. And this graph does something strange, right? If you look at the high points, you have got that steady growth. But you get a couple of real dips. And uh, the, what's interesting is if you think about the recent public protector came into office in 2009, and you see the growth again. But why that dip? Right? So that's a, a question I... Um, Still working on, but I have some theories that I'll suggest in a second. <laughs> Part of it is related to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm going to say. I'm going to try not to. Uh, the, other, the other issue is if you look at it in terms of the finalization of cases. And it partly shows the same pattern. And, but if you notice, when you put the two together, they happen in a slightly different way. In other words, the number of cases that get solved that goes higher earlier in 2003 and then drops off and the number of uh, cases that come in follow in terms of the drop-off. And I think what then, these numbers aren't perfect, so I've got to look at them more carefully. But what's interesting about that general pattern is that the public has been responsive. So what happened was there was an enormous number of solutions in 2003, but it was a public protector who was just solving problems without actually really getting into them. And I think there was a certain sense that that public protector wasn't really dealing with the issues. There was a couple of fairly high-profile cases where that became obvious, and the courts even stepped in at one point. And it's that tension that I think lets people feel, well, this thing's not doing its job, and they stop going. And as soon as the new public protector comes in and it looks like something's happening, the people are going there. And that's fascinating in terms of an institution and how it develops. Yeah, this is the more recent issue in Kantler, and we'll, I will talk about that briefly in terms of the separation of powers, and then we can open up the conversation. But if you look at this as just... The, what's interesting is the national key point was a piece of legislation from the apartheid regime that attempted to keep certain areas out of media and other coverage in the name of national security. And one of the things they tried to do, the government tried to do very quickly when this scandal started to develop around the president's home in rural KwaZulu-Natal uh, in Kantla was to suggest that this was a national key point. In other words, media go away. Uh, and so... The, there's a South African cartoonist, Zapiro, who... And, of course, the, that's where it ends up. Uh, and this was prior to this actually getting to court, uh, the notion that the people actually... And I would say the, 
Gogo Tlaminis are really the support behind this power that the public protector has shown. I will turn now just to finalize this and then open it up for questions. What does this mean for the separation of powers? And in a way, we think about the separation of powers in two ways. In this very formal way of institutions, you have parliament, you have the executive, you have courts, or in a functional way where we think of the parliament doing, uh, making law, the executive implementing law, and the judiciary adjudicating conflicts. So that's the way separation of powers gets dealt with. Very crudely, in fact. Uh, and it's, what's interesting is how little separation of powers is actually theorized or spoken about. Right? It, do it doesn't appear in the Constitution. It's in the principles. But that doesn't actually appear because it's implicit in the structure of the Constitution. And that's how it always comes up. And so what's interesting to me is how, once you create this extra chapter, chapter 9, how, in fact, you've now introduced into the structure implicitly another branch of government. And when this first arrived in the courts, in, DA, in the Democratic Alliance versus the South African Broadcasting Corporation, it was really interesting to see how confused the judge was, the first lower court judge. Because he wanted to say this mattered somehow, but at the same time he couldn't break from his formal notion of how this should work. And so he said, you know, you can't ignore the public protector's decision, but wasn't quite sure how the fact that in the Constitution it says that the public protector has remedial powers. How is this? And it is a hard question. Right? How can the public protector be allowed, which she is allowed to do, go and investigate on her own bat? Doesn't have to wait for a complaint even. Can read the newspaper and say there's a problem and go and investigate. Do the investigation, decide what the problem is, and then decide what the remedy is. I mean, that's extraordinary, right? First of all, that's all the powers wrapped up in one. So there's real danger in that. But the question then is, what would that remedy mean? So in the case of Encantla, where the issue is, for those of you who may not have heard about it, is the fact that the president has a rural homestead in KwaZulu-Natal, which is his private home. It's not one of the national homes like the White House you know, that we have. And in this private, but you know, he still spends time there. And so security is an issue for a president. And so the question was, it needed a security upgrade. What's interesting is, of course, he had started trying to upgrade it before this arose, before he became president. And some of the money from the arms deal, that initial poison chalice, actually was already going into building that private home. So this goes way back, this problem. But once he becomes president, now, well, we need to do a security upgrade. And the government steps in and starts to do that. And they build, if you go online and... I should have produced a picture of it because it is a beautiful homestead now. Absolutely stunning. Uh, but it's rather large. It has swimming pools, helicopter pads. I mean, it's really extraordinary. And the question is, how much of this had to do with security and how much is this private benefit to the president and his family? Private benefit which, of course, he'll retain once he leaves office. And that became the question that was started to be raised. And... As that question was raised, the public protector eventually gets called on to look into it. And one of the problems for the public protector as an institution is that the political opponents in the country, as soon as they have an issue, they go running to the public protector. And the public protector is supposed to take on every political issue that comes and investigate it and produce a remedy. So this institution very quickly gets a lot of pressure on it. Uh, to start doing things. This public protector is really interesting. She's a woman who was active in anti-apartheid work, very, very active in the ANC, a very loyal member of the ANC. Uh, she participates in the process around the, uh, during the time of the constitution making. She is a gender activist, works in the Department of Justice on gender issues after 1994 and is assumed by the leadership of the ANC to be a good, loyal member who will toe the line. And what they failed to notice 
is that she's also a lawyer, and a lawyer who has a backbone of steel. And, you know, I'm really excited by the fact that it turns out many of our lawyers in the new South Africa turn out to have backbones of steel. And I'm like, I'm really appreciating watching that develop over time. Because the politicians don't assume that. And what happens with Inkantla is she begins her investigation. Her report, which she tries to publish, the first thing that happens is government goes into court and tries to stop her publishing it. So this fight began long before it actually went to court as an encounter case. But she publishes it. And she has a problem. Her reports normally go to the president. But the problem is, is the subject of the report is the president. So she does the right thing. She gives it to the president and to parliament, where she has a duty to report as well. Parliament takes the position, as they had been taking for a while in the public protector, that what it means is, reporting means two things. The public protector must come and they get to ask questions about anything, including ongoing investigations. She resists that, and so her relationship with Parliament starts to get tough. And when this report is put before Parliament, they take the position that they can decide how the report should be implemented, or if it should be implemented. The President takes a slightly different position, the president begins to set up a parallel investigation to decide whether this investigation was right or wrong, which is, there's nothing wrong with that, because you should decide whether there is, the report is valid. The problem is, is when their investigation decides to ignore the remedial powers that are constitutionally given to the public protector. But in the meantime, as I said, there was this other case that had started, the Democratic Alliance versus the South African Broadcasting Corporation, which involved the appointment to the, of the head of that corporation of a man that some people said what, had, didn't have the qualifications, or at least it's not clear that he doesn't have the actual qualifications given that he's worked in it for a long time now, but that he didn't have the paperwork when he started. That, that was, he didn't have the matric certificate which was, he was supposed to have to be hired initially into the institution. But now he was head of it. And, uh, yeah, and there were questions about how independent he really was in that role, etc. And as I said, that went to court. And what's interesting to me, because it still has implications going forward now, is eventually now, when that, the, the lower court judge, as I said, was all over the place on it. But when it went to the... the um, Supreme Court of Appeals, the SCA, they came out with a very clear decision that required the institution to respond to the public protector's report in that case. They have responded. They've responded in a way, however, that doesn't really look like a genuine response. They held an event and they said it was a disciplinary event, but everybody was on board to make it go away. Well, that becomes another issue. I believe that's now going up on appeal. So, so the courts... But then when you, the trouble is, if you think about the separation of powers problems inherent in that, however, right? because the court, and the court has now said in the Encantler decision, which came down a few weeks ago, where the constitutional court said that the public protector's remedies are constitutionally granted, and therefore ha she has the power to issue remedial things, uh, decisions, but also pointed out that if another branch of government has a problem with the remedy, if they feel that there's been a mistake, like in all other circumstances, they can go to court and the court can decide whether that should be put aside or not. They can't decide that for themselves. They can do another investigation, they can check it, etc. But the actual decision on the remedial power, they can only set aside if they go to court. And that is the position. The question is, is if they actually do the remedial power but do it in a bizarre way, which is what's going on in this DA case, uh, then the courts are going to be hauled back in to decide whether the... And, you know, and I worry with even in the Encantler case because the decision is, is that now it must go to the Treasury to decide how much the President owes and the President has to pay it back within a certain period of time. And that sets up a real tension in terms of separation of powers because... What happens if it doesn't happen? 
Right? There's a ten. No, I don't think that's going to. I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, who, where the money's going to come from is another issue. But uh, it's they, they're going to. They'll step through the steps. But it does. It starts to lay out for us exactly how this new Chapter Nine institution is in fact becoming part of a separation of powers structure that really is a fourth integrity branch of government. It has now, what they're working out, what this, these opinions are starting to work out, is exactly how the checks and balances will in fact work. Because really the key to any separation of powers system is checks and balances. They're never completely separate. There's always checks and balances. And what's been worked out here is how in practice this fourth branch at least the integrity parts of it, will interact in terms of checks and balances with the other branches. The one big difference, of course, for South Africa is the, supreme, the Constitution is supreme, and unlike the question which remains the so-called counter-majoritarian question in US constitutional law, the South African Constitution says absolutely clearly that the Constitutional Court has the last word on the Constitution. So that doesn't have the same questioning in terms of counter-majoritarianism. That doesn't mean it won't get those questions politically. Right? So that tension remains in terms of the political system that we're talking about. But I think the emergence of this fourth branch is a really unique part of the new constitutionalism in South Africa. And it's going to be fascinating to continue to watch how it plays out. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I'll <laughs> set up at the end of the day that will be a space to gather a lot of our questions. But we do have time for a question or two, and I invite you to call on the floor. Sure. Over there. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has really been wonderful. And uh, you know, together with the, the recent outcome of the Constitutional Court, which has given us great hope as a South African um, you know, since uh, we've had a kind of, you know, a depressing period in the last few years. Professor, will you introduce yourself? My name is Rashid Omar. I'm teaching here at the University of Notre Dame, mm -hmm. the Institute for Peace Studies. Um, my question is that I'm also very excited to hear that you say that South African uh, legal profession has a backbone, which I, I well, believe... At least some of it. it. <laughs> I, I do think that, and this is what I worry about the discourse currently. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, we know that President Zuma is hugely implicated, but he's not alone. Mm -hmm. And he has had legal advice, uh, not only from, from, uh, from but from, from all the other sectors, in mm -hmm. order to get away with what he's gotten away with for a long time. And I want you, you know, the other branches we can speak about, but I want you to sp speak about those uh, legal professionals who have been advising him and have been actually thwarting this particular system, because now you see, Everything is focused on Zuma, but if Zuma goes away, you know, there's beneath there's a whole you know system of people that have been implicated. They're still there, mm -hmm. uh, and so this is my concern. That of course you can get get away with Zuma tomorrow, and he's going to go, I think, before the end of the year. But they still have a huge problem with people who are there who have actually buttressed and supported them. Um, and I want you to think about the legal, you know. Um, yeah. So let's this. think about the legal side of it. What's interesting to me is. If you actually, what's fascinating is if you think about who's been given him direct legal advice. We have a state law advisor. We have a legal structure that's supposed to do this. But in fact, what he did was he took the man who was his, he defended him in earlier criminal trials, and has made him his constitutional advisor. So uh, you know, there's real serious issues about what kind of advice he's getting. I don't think he gets to say, I've got the wrong advice, sorry, right? And the, court, the Constitutional Court has made that clear as well. Uh, the fact is that, yes, there has been a tendency um, for, and I've seen this in many other gov cases that government's been having in South Africa, for them increasingly to look for lawyers who, for pay, will tell them what they want to hear. And I think there's serious issues about that. Now, part of it, we have this cab rank rule among the advocates in South Africa, whoever hires me first, that thing. And I do think that there has to be some discussion in the bar in South Africa about exactly what the responsibilities are of lawyers in terms of giving advice to all, to anybody, not just to the president. Because there's tense, there's, there's a confusion. That's not like we don't know that confusion in the United States, right? We all believe we have 
ethical, legal things to do, but half the time we seem to think that the client pays, therefore, what do they need? And there's, it's, it's not the customer pays, right? We, we are officers of the court as lawyers. So we have a different role. And we, are, of course, represent our client, but we also have to be able to tell our client certain truths. And that seems to be missing in some of these cases, right? And so I do think, yes, there is an issue, but I don't think it's unique to South Africa, number one. And number two, I think that, that how that works itself out in, is, is about the transformation of the legal profession in South Africa as well, in many different ways. And I don't just mean transformation in terms of having advancement of black lawyers and that, which is essential, but also the transformation of thinking as lawyers. Right? What, are, what are our roles in a constitutional democracy as opposed to uh, you know, the old roles in the past? Right? So I think those, those are, that's a very important set of issues. Could I just ask you to build a little bit more on um, Professor Omer's point because that was exactly my question as well. And I, I really wouldn't give as much credit to the U.S. set of lawyers as you just did um, because I've been focus most closely on the drone issue, which is targeted killing. South Africa, thank you, has been one of the few countries, and Desmond Tutu in particular, has spoken out against targeted killing in a very public way, as, as, as been conducted in the US. But we've seen a whole team of government lawyers, in starting in the Clinton administration, through the Bush administration, to the Obama administration, who have been making un, uh, strangely loose arguments about the right to life in order to permit this political <clears throat> policy. So they have careers on the line, advancement, being part of the power groups that have the discussion. And I was listening very closely to your explanation of the public protector. Was an institutional answer the one for the United States or for Australia, the UK, South Africa? But you came down to the backbone of one person being one of the most. So in connection to what you just said, looking at the legal profession, I'm wondering if anything beyond education, which I'm not underplaying as an mm -hmm. educator, but beyond education, if you see a way to elevate our profession for a closer commitment to the rule of law as opposed to careerism and our own financial no, and I think that's a really serious set of issues. So, in the terms of, I don't want to be misunderstood in terms of the public protector. The argument I'm trying to make is, in fact, it is the institutional development. And I'll add a, a piece which I, I didn't put in. What's fascinating to me about the way this particular public protector has evolved the institution. I spoke in part about the Mama, uh, the Gogo Dlamini cases going out to getting responsive to the public. But there's another side to it as well, is she worked very hard from the beginning to professionalize her staff. And one of the ways she did that was she had the same staff that she came in on, she tried to build them, but she built links with ombuds officers in other parts of the world. She had very close relations with both the British ombuds office and the Ontario ombuds office in Canada, and sent her employees there for training and got people from there down to the office in Johannesburg for training. And those institutional links, when she was particularly in battle, what was fascinating was to see her reach out to those links and see the role those links played in, say, in giving her support. Because you're absolutely right that the people in position under pressure for about careers, and it gets a lot worse than just careers, threatens, I mean, she, she had security on her home, and it started buzzing at every time of day and night, and, you know, there was issues with the kid as well, because the, she had a kid who was driving a car and whatever, but the issues were that she was put under enormous personal pressure, as well as political pressure, as well as just the legal pressure she was in terms of the job. So, yes, people are vulnerable as individuals. And no, no individual's backbone is that strong that they could stand up to all that by themselves. They build an in institutional culture around themselves. The, the, the brilliance of her leadership has been in building that institutional culture around herself in that office. 
I've, I've had, you know, as I've been studying this office, I've been spending a bit of time there, I've been talking to other members of the office, and what's fascinating to me is how she's been able to incorporate. So there's one little story, a student of, an LLM student of mine who went back to South Africa <coughs> is now the deputy public protector. But when he was given that position, he was given it from his friends inside the ANC, I know them all, and his idea was there to, wa to watch her, to, control, to try and control her. And he behaved very badly the first time they went to Parliament. He sat next to her in Parliament and started contradicting her as her deputy in Parliament. And he'd been set up to do that. He'd been encouraged to do that. And her response to that, she could have just tried to fight with him or whatever, her response to that was to say, okay, I know what I've got here. Kevin, that's his name, Kevin Malunga. Kevin, you know, there's all these problems out in the rural areas for people. There's these <laughs> difficulties. Why don't you take that as your... Why don't you go look? And what was fascinating is, you know, Kevin's not a bad person, but he's thought his political leaders thought this, that this person had got out of control in this institution. But when Kevin went out to the rural areas, Kevin started seeing corruption and hit him in the face. And all of a sudden, I'd run into Kevin and he'd be going... This is terrible. So, oh, really? <laughs> Fascinating. And, you know, if you listen, if you watch his voice evolve in that position. But again, there was a politically astute move of hers to put him in contact with the real world and say, go see what it's like out there. Don't sit in the office in Pretoria. Tell me I'm not doing my job. Go, go have a look. Go see what it looks like. But it is that broader institution building process. And so if you think about it in terms of lawyers, um, you know, Unfortunately, if you think about the torture memos and everything else that went on around that in the United States, uh, what they precisely did was bring in a bunch of people who would be so loyal. So if you choose your lawyers to build your team, uh, or go past some of the professional lawyers that were in place, right? I mean, there was enormous objection within the government to some of those policies. No, but from people in state in the State Department, etc., who were older lawyers who'd been there, there a long some, time. There was some opposition. I, I but they wouldn't go public, right? right? The big thing is they wouldn't put their own right. careers on the line. Them. And, you know, that's the challenge to young lawyers, right? How do you go out there and decide to put your career on the line uh, and potentially not have the career you were hoping for? Those are the tensions. And particularly when you see power so much on the one side. And for South African lawyers, that's also difficult because we have a, what I call a dominant party democracy for the moment. Uh, I don't think it's a single party democracy because we have other parties, but there's a dominant party, traditional post-liberation dividend that a party gets. The only question is over time, uh, what happens to that? Does it retain its legitimacy? Uh, does the party fracture? And those are the questions that are constantly being asked today about the party, the question about what lies behind it. Uh, you know, I think there are many different factions within, and some that are still very good people who want to do good things. And the question is whether they get their opportunity uh, and what happens to those people. Uh, but that, the issue of professionalism, particularly within the legal profession, uh, I think... The legal profession has never been great about discipline in itself, let's be honest. And the question is, you know, can they do that there? But. Professor Kluge, thank you very much.